uh, turn to the letter to the Ephesians and chapter 4. Ephesians and chapter 4. And let's read from verse 17. Ephesians 4.17 This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put off, or putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor. Notice you're always putting off something and putting on something. So you put off stealing, but put on labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you may the Lord bless the reading of his own word <clears throat> And to turn to our text particularly, let's just go back to the passage that we've been thinking of over the last couple of days. The letter to the Galatians this time, just the previous letter in the Bible. The letter to the Galatians and chapter 5. And our text uh, this morning moves to verse 16. Verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. Very important words for our theme. I say then... Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, most of you uh, know that our theme has been living and walking in the Spirit. And I hope we've seen what that means, what it means to be alive in the Spirit and to be actually walking or having a lifestyle in the Spirit. We've seen what it means and I hope to we've seen why it is important. It is absolutely a matter of life and death. As we're told in the Romans, if we live according to the flesh, we shall die. But if in the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the old man, then we shall live. The same thing is being taught here in the passage that we're looking at. Uh, we are told in verse 21 that if our life is characterized by envy, murders, drunkenness, and so on, then at the end of the verse we will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
So it is a matter of life and death. <clears throat> now, by God's grace then, let's turn this morning to think of the all-important question really, which is the how question. How do I walk in the Spirit and so ensure that the life that I am living is the life of a true Christian, the life of a conqueror, the life of an heir of the kingdom of God. How do I walk in the Spirit? And even if you're still persuaded that you are a Christian, it may well be the case that you know today that something has gone wrong with your walk. And that the fruit of the Spirit is not as evident as it used to be. And you're well aware that you're not only aware of the flesh, you always were, but somehow it seems to have a kind of ascendancy. And you may be troubled about that particular thing, and rightly so. And maybe it's a serious question for you today. I, I need to know how at least to rediscover what walking in the Spirit really means. Because, of course, <clears throat> you'll be unhappy until you do. You'll be at least that. It's impossible uh, to be a happy Christian if the flesh has, has found a place that it should not in your life. So how do you walk in the Spirit? How do you recover? How do you become a mature Stable, self-controlled, balanced Christian, as you're called to be. Now the answer, first of all, to that lies in the text that we really had last night. If you look at um, chapter 6 of this letter, and verse 7, let's read verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived, God is not Mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So our attention is being drawn there to the relationship between what we sow in life and what we reap in life. If you're reaping uh, bad stuff, if you're reaping fleshly things, the reason, Paul says, for that is because you're sowing bad stuff in your life. It's as simple as that. It's as straightforward as that. If you want to see good things in your life, if you want to see spiritual fruit in your life, you need to sow the right kind of spiritual seed. So to make that concrete again, if going back to chapter 5 and verse 22, if you want to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life, the harvest, if you want to reap love, joy, peace, if you want to reap long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, then you need to sow something to ensure that you get that. What that is, leave that for the moment, but the point is that to see these things you need to be busy sowing something. If on the other hand you want your life to be full, which you don't, but maybe it's becoming that way, but if you want your life to be full, in verse 19, of fornication or adultery or uncleanness or lewdness or idolatry or hatred even, or jealousy or anger, then all you need to do is sow in such a way that you get it. Because that's the way it works. God's not mocked. You shouldn't be either. The law of cause and effect is woven into the fabric of the universe. It's woven into the fabric of the spiritual universe too. I mean, what you sow, you reap. Everybody knows that. The world will tell you that. You should know it yourself too. What you sow, you reap. So if that's the fruit, what are you sowing? Or what indeed is sowing? Sowing is obviously something that produces that fruit. But how do we sow? Well, to understand that, we need to go to the source of all our words and actions. We need to go to the inward place. We need to go to the heart. Or if you like, to the mind. It essentially means the same thing here. It's in the mind or the heart that this battle is fought and where the battle 
is one. It's your heart that matters. That's why Proverbs says, keep your heart with all diligence. I mean, give yourself to it, to keeping, or as the English word really means, guarding your heart. Then guard your heart with all diligence because he says, out of it are all the issues of life. Everything that flows from you, the words that you speak, the thoughts that you think, the way in which they come, the life that you choose, the decisions that you make, the friends that you choose, the lifestyle, it all flows from the heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. Again, as the word of God says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I think we can take that in two ways, two legitimate ways. They're both included in what's actually meant in the words. As you think in your heart, that's you. Um, if I was to discover your heart, that's who you are. You could make a good show of presenting something else to me externally. And maybe for a while you could persuade me that that's you, but it's not you. As you think in your heart, that's you. The text can also be taken this way, that as you think in your heart, that makes you. That is what you become. In other words, as you choose to think certain, certain things, that's what you become in life. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Now, so Savior said, uh, when he was listening to the Pharisees with their with their own conviction that they were God's people and that they kept God's law, but yet spoke evil, attributing his own good works to the power of Satan himself. Jesus said, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things, good words and good actions. An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And by your words, you shall be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. For every idle word a man speaks, he shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Justified by faith? Yes. Are you judged by your works? Absolutely yes. Are you judged by your words? Absolutely yes. And all these things will be found consistent. I think I referred to that on Friday. The whole package will be consistent. If faith in Christ is there, then the record of your words will reveal faith in Christ, and the record of your life will reveal faith in Christ. That's what justification means. That's how it's to be understood. It's all consistent. But words matter. The heart matters. To highlight how this works... I want to remind you of a, a proverb. It's not a biblical proverb, although the thought is biblical. It's a proverb that's a bit out of fashion, but some of you might remember learning it. Uh, learn it. Remember it. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Okay, so that is just linking causally, very directly linking what you think in your head to heaven and hell. What you think in your head is directly linked to heaven and hell. Let me just read it again. Sow a thought, sow it, not just think it, but sow it. Sow a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character, which is forming all the time. So a character, and you reap your destiny. And you sow with your mind. You sow in your thought processes. <clears throat> By sowing, I mean, I said there, uh, sowing a thought as distinct from simply thinking it. When the Bible speaks of sowing here, or when I speak to you about sowing a thought, I'm talking about a voluntary thing. I'm not talking about an involuntary, involuntary thought. I mean, you know what these are, probably. 
I'm talking about voluntary thoughts. I'm talking about what you do with the thoughts in your head. I think the distinction is important in a couple of ways because many of the thoughts in our minds are involuntary. They just arrive. I mean, they're not there and bang, they're there. And sometimes they're terrible thoughts. Sometimes they're sinful thoughts. Of course, what you do with them is the issue. Uh, sometimes they're blasphemous thoughts. Sometimes they're persistent thoughts. And they become even more persistent sometimes when you simply try to chase them away. There's a way of dealing with things. There's a way of not dealing with these things. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you have, as Christians have had trouble with the sudden uh, arrival of blasphemous thoughts in your minds. Uh, some very prominent Christians have had that trouble. Um, some preachers of the word have had it. Spurgeon uh, famously experienced it from time to time in his life. Bunyan certainly did too. I knew a minister who was troubled with it. Sometimes when he stood up in the pulpit, blasphemous thoughts would enter his mind. Uh, he was troubled by them, of course. Of course he would be. But, um, and, and I've known people who also have in this problem, ordinary Christians who just struggle sometimes with these things. And what I say to them in a way may sound a little strange and I don't want it to be misunderstood, but what I normally say is, although these things are troubling, don't be troubled too much by them. Although they are troubling, don't be troubled too much by them because they're not really your thoughts. That's actually how Bunyan got relief, because he thought that these blasphemous thoughts were a sign that he was blaspheming against the Holy Spirit and there was no hope for him. And very often Christians can conclude that. But the bottom line is they're not yours. You don't like these thoughts. You don't want these thoughts, crucially. You're not even entertaining these thoughts. You're harassed and distressed by them, so they're just not yours. To take something that's actually very close to this, when our Lord was in the wilderness... And the voice or the suggestion came to him to pick up the stones and the, the stones and to turn them into bread. Or uh, when the voice came to him saying, why don't you just prove God's love for you in this stinking, howling wilderness by just casting yourself off the temple to see if he'll fulfill his promise to look after you. Well, was that Christ's own idea? No, it was, it was the devil's thought and it was the devil's suggestion. So why... Be troubled with it as though it was your own. If it's an involuntary thought, by all means take it to the Lord and tell the Lord that these things are in your head, but rest assured they're not yours. And leave him in his time to take them away and just go on living your life. It's as simple in a way as that. And there may of course be certain mental conditions where these things are seriously repetitive and so on, but Still, you catch the gist of what I'm saying. I don't want to get too sidetracked with that. But these are involuntary thoughts. They're involuntary thoughts. And, and there are many other involuntary thoughts that, that can be sinful and problematic, even if they're not blasphemous. The issue is always what you do with them. Luther once famously said that you can't stop a bird flying over your head, but you can stop it nesting in your hair. And that's the issue when it comes to involuntary thoughts. Uh, but just before I, I leave it, let me say something else to you. Um, don't think that your thoughts are somehow independent of your will. Uh, and, that, and that thoughts are just something you can never control. Thoughts are something that you can, to a considerable extent, control. And as you work at it, and how you work at it, we're just coming to, but as you work at it, you'll discover that your mind begins to operate differently. As you really yield yourself to the Spirit of the Lord, you'll discover that your thought processes become more controlled and more disciplined. So don't think of yourself as a victim to your thoughts. My main point is that sowing begins in your mind. How does it work? Well, it's not rocket science, is it? Let's turn to the passage here in Galatians 5. Let's take, for example, the sexual sins of verse 19. You have four of them grouped together there. The works of the flesh. Now, 
We're not talking about sowing here yet. We're talking about the evident results. The works of the flesh are adultery, which is sexual, uh, illicit sexual relationships involving marriage somewhere. For an occasion, it's not necessarily involving marriage. It's just general uh, sexual misconduct. Uncleanness is a general sexual impurity, as is lewdness. How does this work? works, of course, in the mind. That's where all this stuff begins. It begins in your head. We all appreciate beauty. We were made that way. There's nothing wrong with that. But the Lord Jesus, about, uh, in speaking about adultery, challenges the Pharisaic understanding of it, which was very external. Adultery was the act of the visible act, the tangible physical act, Jesus says, no, it's not that. That may be first degree adultery, but there are second degree and third degree, and it's real and it's genuine. If a man looks at a woman, or indeed if a woman looks at a man, in order to lust after that person, then such a person, he says, has already committed adultery in the heart. You've done it. Now that, that look can be encouraged by the other party. It's possible for, for you to encourage you to look that way. And that's something as Christians that we need to take seriously. The standard, the standard of behavior and dress in the world is just really going down. It's not up to us to just follow it wherever it goes, is it? We need to set and to keep and to maintain biblical standards. Your role in life is not to inspire lust in you. Your role in life is not to inspire lust in you. We've got to remember that. But the Lord is laying the onus on all of ourselves here. That's fine. I mean, it's always easy for me to be guilty of something and offload the blame on the other party. It would be very easy for David to say, well, there I was on my balcony, and what was that woman doing bathing there? Well, it is a good question, I suppose, but that's not his call. His call is to deal with that properly, which, of course, infamously, he did not do. And I'm sure he did probably blame her, and he blamed a hundred things when he was avoiding blaming himself. But the Lord focuses on my eye and my look and why, why I look and what I am doing with that look. And this lustful look uh, can be cast in a street, it can be cast in a magazine, it can be cast in a computer screen, it can be cast on a church pew. Of course it can. And the point the Lord makes is that at the very point that happens, you have sown. You've already sown it. It's no longer an involuntary thought. It's no longer somebody simply walking past you and noticing, well, that's a very beautiful girl or a very handsome guy or whatever. It's gone beyond that. And at that point, it's adultery. It's adultery. You see, but it's not. Jesus says, it is. Because the act has been committed in your heart. It's been committed in your heart. You've reaped. You sowed and you reaped already in the heart. And of course, if, if you give way to that process regularly, if, if you start sowing the act of looking lustfully, you can sow that in any of these places too, in the magazine or on the computer or on, in the church or anywhere. If you begin to sow that act of looking lustfully, it's more than likely it will break out into first degree sexual sin of one kind or another. But that's because it all happened in here, or in here if you like. Seems true with murder and hatred. Look at these things in, in verse 20. I mean, he speaks of idolatry and sorcery. That's a religious sin. And how you slip into religious sin is another interesting matter too. Uh, worship becomes compromised and polluted. But then he speaks about hatreds, contentions, and jealousies, and outbursts of wrath. Jesus tells us that <clears throat> hatred is murder. Now, we'd like to distinguish the two. But he says, if you really hate in your heart, 
you've murdered a person. You, you want that person out of the way. You've murdered them. You've murdered them in your heart, murdered them in your mind. And, and that's where it began, you see. I mentioned Saul yesterday, or was it the day before? For whatever reason, Saul became a very proud man. And pride's oldest daughter is jealousy, so it's no surprise that he was jealous. That, of course, became hatred. And that, of course, became murder. I'm conscious that he never killed David physically, but he killed him, all right. When that javelin flew through the air, that's murder. The fact that it missed him is neither here nor there, because it was meant to hit him. It wasn't meant to wound him or to hurt him. It was meant to obliterate him and to kill him. Hatred and murder, and it began in the mind. And every single act becomes itself something that you sow. And you've got to deal with that before it becomes a habit and before it becomes your character because your character, as I said before, isn't fixed, it's changing. And it's changing according to what you do and the decisions that you make in life. I feel it's so important for you young people to know especially that every decision that you make in life is another brick in the wall of your character. It's setting you along the course in terms of your destiny and where you're going. You, th you think things like the, the, the choice of your friends or the choice of the movie that you watch or the choice of the place that you go. You just think, well, it's a choice. It's what I do today. It becomes part of who you are. It becomes part of who you are and the end point. So, so you can't just think, well, I'm going to play around with sin for a year or two. Play around with sin for a year or two, and you might find yourself playing around with it for the rest of your life. Because you don't just have that control. You, you can't just let things go and then pull them back. Don't be mocked. Don't be deceived. Don't mock God for whatever we sow, that we shall also reap. So this battle... This battle of flesh and spirit is being played out in your mind, in your thought processes. Now, if you've got a problem with the flesh, we all do. If you've got a serious problem and a growing problem with the flesh, you want to know how to cut that out. The answer is that you've got to stop sowing to it. And okay, you say, well, how do I do that? That takes us to our text here in verse 16. Look at it, read it, read it a hundred times. Plant this firmly in your mind. Walk in the Spirit. Verse 16. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Listen to the importance of that. I mean, think about it. Think about what it's actually saying. The way to avoid doing what you shouldn't is doing what you should. The way to avoid doing what you shouldn't is doing what you should. Or flip that round. Doing what you should is the way to avoid doing what you shouldn't. That's a very positive thing. It means that developing a spiritual life means that you'll have less trouble with the fleshly life. Why is that a positive thing? Well, because it's really hard to attack the flesh. It's really hard to sit down and say, well, I've got a problem with my anger here, so I'm going to deal with my anger. <clears throat> or I'm going to deal with my jealousy. I'm going to try not to be jealous. I'm going to try hard not to think unclean or impure thoughts. I'm, I'm going to try really, I'm going to discipline myself to stop thinking and to stop living like that. Doesn't work. <laughs> have you discovered it doesn't work? Of course you have. You've all gone through periods of your life where you've tried really hard to do something and you can't do it. But this text is telling you that that's not how you do it anyway. You can only defeat the flesh by living a positive spiritual life. And there's a sense in which the flesh then almost takes care of itself. It's a positive thing. You begin walking in the spirit in your own mind. 
If you turn forward to the passage we read for a second, I want you to notice something important in it. And you'll find this pattern again and again in the Bible. But let's just stick to where we read it. Ephesians 5, turn forward to it. Verse 22. Ephesians 4, sorry, verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22. Now, here you've got clothes that you've got to put off, right? Uh, remember, you're a new man or new woman in Christ. You're not who you used to be, right? New creation. You remember that from Friday. New person, right? So why are you wearing the clothes you're wearing is the question here. That's what, that's what Paul's asking. And he says, I want you to put off concerning your former conduct, everything that belongs to it, put off the old man. In other words, the old man's clothes. That's what he's talking about here. Put off his clothes. And in verse 24, he's telling you to put on the new man's clothes. Now, the old man's clothes are just adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, hatred, murder, contention, strife, jealousy. Put them off. Get them off. And when he says put on... The new man, in verse 24, he's, he means put on, put on the new man's clothing, okay? Put on long-suffering, meekness, uh, gentleness, put on self-control, put on love and joy and peace. That's fine, put off and put on. Except he doesn't say just put off and put on, does he? I missed out a verse, didn't I? I missed out verse 23. And no way should you miss out verse 23. Because verse 23 absolutely links the two processes. Putting off and putting on. So he tells you to put off the flesh in verse 22, that's fine. But be renewed instead in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man that is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, you can't walk in the Spirit without mental renewal. And I don't mean changing your mind. Uh, changing your mind's fine, but won't sort out the problem. You don't just need to change your mind, you need your mind to be renewed. And he's talking here to people who are already Christians, who already have had their minds renewed, but the point about mental renewal is that it needs to go on and on and on all the time. And, and maybe you've forgotten to renew your mind. You say, well, I haven't a clue how to do it. Well, you used to. Now, let's leave that for a moment. But the point for now is that you need to keep doing it. You've got to keep renewing your mind. Well, you say, yes, but what does that mean? How do I do it? Well, let me stress this point to you. And, and really, in many ways, Reverend Kingswood almost covered in his opening prayer almost <laughs> everything I wish to say in a certain sense. You renew your mind when you meet God in true worship. That's how and when you renew your mind. You renew your mind when you meet God in true worship. When you meet him in word and prayer. When you come to him spirit to spirit, person to person, and his word reaches you, and your prayer reaches him, and the point is that something happens. Something happens. That encounter becomes a channel of God's transforming grace. And I mean that as something real and genuine. It becomes an actual channel of God's transforming grace. So that in that encounter, person to person, you change. And every time it happens, you change. I'm not asking you whether you're conscious of changing. That's an irrelevance. But you do. You do. Providing you are approaching God in faith in that encounter. In other words, providing you're really in the presence of God. I mean, none of this op operates just automatically. You can come in here today, Reverend Kingswood called us to worship. In other words, we are coming into the 
covenantal transforming presence of God, where the ordinances are unleashed and where the power of God is unleashed. But if you are not coming to God in faith, it will wash over you. You'll go out the way you came in, except that you're more accountable going out than you were coming in. Because you ought to have believed and you ought to have heard. But if you come to meet God, and that's important in worship, and how many people forget it? I mean, worship is not simply doing what God has commanded us to do, although that's, the, that's a vital component in it. It's about encounter. It's not simply about being taught either. It's not simply about singing or saying or doing the right things. It's about meeting God and asking God to speak to you personally through the word. Asking God to renew your mind and heart as you are encountering him in this process. Do, do you anymore even think of worship like that? Do you think of it like that in private, in the awfully named quiet time? Quiet time would be far better off being a loud time sometimes, when we speak and cry. But do you have such an expectation in your personal time with God, that when you pray to him every day, that he will change you every day, that he'll clean you, that he'll wash your mind, that he'll make you, accept, that he'll, he'll make you receptive, that he'll make you grow, that, that he changes you? Or is that just something you do and then you get on with trying to live the Christian life and it, you can't do it. You can't do it like that. But encountering God is the only thing that unleashes God's transforming power in your life. Turn to a text that, that Reverend Kings would actually quote it in his prayer, which is so, so important. 2 Corinthians and chapter 3. Second Corinthians 3, and the very last verse in the chapter. Now, this is a great verse, really, and in terms of thinking about how you can be changed as a person, I, I know of no more powerful text than this. In, in those terms, in terms of changing you as a person, I know nothing more powerful. All of us, he says, with an unveiled face, are seeing as in a mirror. Now this is, this is about reading the Bible. Well, let, let me read the text before I explain it. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, our being, all of us are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, which I think can really only mean one degree of glory to another, an advancing degree of glory. We are being transformed into that image by the Spirit of the Lord. We all need to take that in, in connection with just how, how profound it is and how important it is. What it is essentially saying is that as you are looking into the Bible prayerfully, expectantly, worshipfully, as you're looking into the Bible and receiving it in the presence of God, asking God to do this thing for you, as you do that, as you do it, you are being changed from one degree of glory to another by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Real worship changes you. Changes you. Prayer is critical in that. Uh, the word is to no avail unless it is prayerfully read because you're calling on the presence of God. You're calling on the power of God. You're coming into the presence of God. God is in your presence. And it's in that encounter that the change happens. That's why the Puritans used to refer to means of grace, or if you like, channels or media of grace. Media through which the transforming power of God reaches your life and soul. Worship changes you if you're worshiping properly changes you. It renews your mind. How does it do that? How does it work? Uh, you've said that, the, that, that this transforming power goes on in the encounter. Well, how does it do it? Well, it does it in this way, because 
God applies the word to you in such a way that it cleans you. And he applies forgiveness to you in such a way that that cleans you. Uh, Reverend Kings would refer to this day as being the first day of the rest of your life. It's a wonderful thought for a Christian to have all the time. And I keep saying to my own congregation that the glorious thing about Christianity is the amount of new starts that it provides. The amount of new opportunities. The way in which it always calls you to think that even though you have messed up and not done things right, it calls you just to come back and to get it right and to put it right. And the fact of the matter is that when you come to God, a real cleansing takes place. So that a slate is clean and a, a thought process begins to be readjusted and actions begin to change and habits begin to change because you've met God and God's met you. Isn't that exciting? I mean, what else can do that? What else can obliterate the stain of guilt that you've got? What, what else can do that? What else can wipe it away? What else can change the influence of a bad habit that's been destroying your life for a couple of years or more? What else can undo the power of that bad habit which has you in its grip except the power of God that's unleashed as you start really entering his presence? Forgiveness cleanses you and the washing of the water of the word cleanses you too. Ephesians 5. We're told there that the power of the word is a detergent. It's a detergent. It cleans your soul. What a thought that is. Are you telling me that, that I am actually being totally renewed by an encounter with God, a prayerful encounter in his word? Yes, that is exactly what's being said. Exactly what's being said. And it's wonderful. You're changed. Now, if you understand that process, if you understand what I'm talking about, you need to engage in this process. Jesus said, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. In the Reformed world, one of her problems is that if we know these things, we think we are blessed. In fact, you could go out of this house today and say, oh, you know, I learned something new there today. I learned that I am actually really being cleansed and changed by an act of living worship. And then on you go as you were before. What's the point of that? If you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. I speak from experience. Um, I remember when I was making uh, ordaining deacons in my first congregation, which seems a long time ago because it is now. But I, 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 rem I vividly remember doing it and dealing with a passage where the, apostle, where the apostles as teachers of the word say, that these deacons are to give themselves to the ministry of tables, we must give ourselves to word and prayer. And it struck me, as I'm sure it struck many a minister at different times in their lives, it struck me that prayer was my calling too. I had thought of word as my calling and given myself to word, made sure that I, I knew how or that I gave myself seriously to word. But prayer... In fact, uh, the order of the words is the other way around. We will give ourselves to prayer and to the word. And it struck me. I need to pray more than anyone. As a, as a preacher of the word, I need to pray. Prayer is a real part of my life. I need to stand in the gap for the congregation. I need to intercede for them. I need to intercede for them individually. I need to intercede for them as families. I, it's part of my work. It's part of my calling uh, like it's nobody else's. It's in a different way. And when the thing dawned on me, I did what many a person does. I thought, well, I, I need to get a book on prayer or I need to think about prayer. So I, I did. I turned to my shelf where all the books are on prayer. And I'm not going to say I heard a voice because I didn't hear a voice. But I was as well hearing a voice. Because God effectively said to me, I'm not asking you to read a book about prayer. I'm asking you to pray. And reading a book about something is not the same as doing the thing. And in our foolishness, we can think it is. But it's not. It's not. Leave the book and start to pray. Do it. Do the thing. Do the thing. And that 
gives rise to the all-important question, do you take seriously the renewal of your own mind daily by the word of God and prayer? Daily. You wash the rest of yourself daily. Well, probably. <laughs> I assume that you do. I assume at least you do it weekly, seriously. But you do it daily, don't you? And, I mean, you take care about your clothing anyway. I assume you put your clothes on in the morning. And you want to be presented the way that people want to see you. Is it any different in the Christian life? Do you not want to be washed in the morning? Do you not want to put on your clothes in the morning? Do you not want to live out the day in the power of God? Do you not want to be seen to be living out the day in the power of God? Have you not washed in the morning? Have you not clothed yourself in the morning? Or is it a case that somehow uh, we smell of the old world and we look like the old world, that, that people are in our presence and they, they don't get the sense that we've been with Jesus? Because we haven't. And your quiet time has, well, I'm not going to call it that, but the secret place, the time when you're on your own with God, which is what Jesus called it, you remember? He said, go into your own room, the secret room, fence off some space, fence off some time, and be on your own with God. Has that disappeared? Has its power disappeared? Has its transforming power disappeared? I mean, is the word warm or cold? Is your relationship with God warm or cold? Well, if that is not integral in your life on a daily basis, don't even dream of telling me that the flesh is not alive in your life. Don't, don't waste your time, because I'll tell you, it is. It is. How can it possibly be otherwise when you're not renewed in the spirit of your mind? That's where everything that's who you are before God, who you are on your own before God. So, so important. And that's really another um, incredible thing, because I certainly remember when I became a Christian 30 odd years ago that this was drummed into me. It was really drummed into me the importance of, of, of a a living walk with God and making sure that I spent time getting the word directly from God in my heart and, and, and pouring myself out before God and God in honoring that just coming in and energizing and strengthening me. But you know, honestly, I think the language has slipped out of the discourse of so many churches. In fact, some people will say to you, well, I don't need a regular disciplined prayer time because I pray all the time. My answer to that is you don't pray all the time unless you've got a regular disciplined prayer life. You really don't. I remember reading a Christian who said that his whole life was prayer. He didn't need times of prayer. And I thought, well, that's nonsense. That's absolute pietistic nonsense. I mean, if our Lord told us to enter the secret place, as he did himself, just one to one with God, who am I to say that I don't need to fence a time and I don't need to fence a space? I do. I do. And you do too. And when we need to do it, we need to prioritize that. Work it into your schedule. You've done everything else. You, you may be disciplined yourself to go to the gym every day. And that was tough at the beginning. Now you do it quite easily. You managed it with your food even, perhaps. You, you managed a diet and you've disciplined yourself to do that. And it was tough at first to resist all that sugar and all that stuff. Fine. But where's this? Where's this? It may be tough to get that started too. Sometimes you'll start to pray, you'll start to read and there's nothing in it. Well, tell God there's nothing in it for you yet. Just keep at it and you'll start to meet him and he'll start to meet you. Just prioritize it. Do him the honor of prioritizing it. Sometimes maybe your wife says, you give me no time, so you say, well, I need to work that in. Work this in. I get up early. You're a minister. It's fine for you as a minister. It's your job. Okay, I acknowledge that. I have a tremendous luxury. There is no doubt about that. I enter my study. And it, it is my prayer room. And it is easy for me to find time. Fair enough. I acknowledge that. Right? I acknowledge that. But honestly, it doesn't matter what your job is. You can factor this into your day. You can factor it into your day. Just do it. 
Nike, of course, the, the famous brand, um, I don't know if this is still its slogan, just do it. The famous tick, Nike, do it. That's it. If you want to conquer, which is what Nike is, the god of conquest, just do it. To talk about it, do it. If your mind is renewed, uh, two things happen. Two things happen. And they become easier. The first is simply putting on your new clothes. Galatians 5.22 The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering people. Oh, well, that's hard when the flesh is ruling. Kindness becomes difficult too. How can I keep serving people who are annoying me? Uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, when you've been angry for so long. Self-control when you've been indisciplined. Chapter 6, verse 10. Being good and kind to your pastor. Um, uh, that's, sorry, that's chapter 6, verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in good things with him who teaches. Obviously that's important. It wouldn't be written there if it wasn't. Verse 10, as we have opportunity, here's the Spirit's work, let us do good to everyone, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. The fact of the matter is that it just becomes easier to live the way you should if your mind's renewed. It stands to reason. You're not toiling anymore. It just becomes easier to forgive. It just becomes easier to love because your mind is new. It also becomes easier to resist temptation. Look at verse 16, the words of the text. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you've started to renew your mind and you start to work at these things, serving people, loving people, the flesh begins to weaken. David infamously gave way to Bathsheba. Joseph famously did not give way to the seduction of Potiphar's wife. Why the difference? It's very, very simple, the difference, actually. Very simple. Joseph, in spite of all his trials and difficulties, was consistent and faithful down the line. He, he didn't slacken off in his walk with God. He just kept looking to the Lord. And, and when... when Trouble and danger just arose like that. He could deal with it. It didn't just arise like that. We're told that she did that every day. He was, he was under that pressure to lie with that woman every day. And when, when she upped the ante, as it were, he, he left his garment in her hand. Interestingly, he was stuck in a dungeon for years for being faithful. Uh, I sometimes expect to... If I have the slightest bit of faithfulness, that I should be crowned immediately with glory and honor. But that's not the way that it works. But the point is that he was faithful. David, on the other hand, it wasn't such a big thing. She was at a distance. She didn't do anything overtly, as far as we know, to address himself. But he fell. Why did he fall? You know fine well. The chapter begins by telling us that he's sitting in the afternoon idle in his palace when everyone else is out at battle and where he used to be too. It's all so simple, really. The simple things are the important things. The important things in the Christian life are the simple things, the straightforward things. He was out of his place before God. Therefore, he was out of his duty. When you're out of your place before God and when you're out of your duty, anything can happen. And he spent the rest of his life suffering the consequences. Let me just leave you. I'm conscious that I've gone on for so long. Let me just leave you with a couple of texts that uh, hammer home the same message here about the importance of the mind. If you turn, uh, first of all, to Romans 13, 14. So there'll, there'll just be a, a bit of a flicking of pages for a while, here, but, but just look them all up. Romans 13 and 14. Just for context's sake, in verse 8 he's been telling us just how to love each other and how to live. 
And in verse 11, he, he sums it up. He says, do this, do all this. In other words, uh, honor your brethren, love your neighbors, and keep the law of God. Do this knowing the time. But now it's high time to awaken out of our sleep. And, and really, there's a special way in which that applies to us. In the 21st century Western world, the world needs living Christians, not dead, sleepy ones. Knowing the time that it's high time to awaken out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the flesh, you could say, the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk or live properly, he says, or decently, as in the daytime. Not in revelries, which is really parties, drunkenness, lewdness and lust, and then not in strife and envy, but put on the new man, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, it's worth pausing there because he doesn't actually describe what that looks like. He doesn't itemize the clothing. He just names a person. And that's interesting because it's not just Christ who empowers you by his spirit, but Christ is always the model. When you read the scriptures, I don't feel any sense of awkwardness or hesitancy in saying read the gospels the most. Watch Christ and observe him and listen to him and just put him on. He, he is the, the one that we desire and long to be like, even out of a sense of gratitude. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Notice the order again. Put, put him on and make no provision for the flesh. <clears throat> Some people flee temptation, but they leave a forwarding address. Don't make any provision. Colossians 3 and verse 2. Well, actually just for context sake, verse 1 as well. <clears throat> Colossians 3 verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that belong to Jesus and his kingdom, not on the things on the earth. Why? Because you, the old you, died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Verse 5, Therefore put to death your members on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, and so on. And in verse uh, 8, Put off all these further, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Get them, off, get them out of your mouth, these things. Don't lie to each other. And verse 10, you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Last verse, Romans 12 and verse 1. Romans 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world. Don't, don't be squeezed into its mold. And notice he doesn't say be conformed to something else. He says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where it all happens that you may prove or discover in your life what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And as we start to discipline a renewed mind, our lives begin to change. And you should expect nothing less as a Christian than a transformed life. Let's pray.